I would like to introduce Lauren Steffel. Uh, she was a TDMP student um, here at Ferris, and she was the former host of the Ferris Trolls, a uh, little prank show we had here. Uh, now she's working as a freelance videographer and photographer for all kinds of sports. Um, she's very cool, and I'm very excited to have her speak. So give it up. Howdy. Um, so this is my little LinkedIn bio page, but my name is Lauren and I'm currently a freelancer. I spend most of my time freelancing in sports, but have also done a variety of other jobs throughout my time behind a camera. Five years ago, oh, five years ago I was sitting in these seats and eight years ago I was a senior in high school attending this event as a prospective student. This is now my fifth time at this event and I'm really grateful to be on the other side of the room and speaking to you all. After I confirmed that I would speak, these were the two questions that Josh presented me with. And I sat with them a lot longer than I'd like to admit because I didn't really know how to answer them. They stumped me so much that I actually made a timeline of my entire work life since getting to college. No, I, I'm not kidding. I spent way too long making this. It's probably why I was still making finishing touches on this presentation yesterday. I started at Ferris in the fall of 2015. I took a tour of the TDMP program with Josh in the spring, and it was convincing enough to have me sign up not too long after that. Throughout my time at Ferris, I had zero idea what I wanted to do with my degree. I knew that I liked to film and document things, and there really wasn't anything else that I knew. There was a long period of time where I thought I wanted to be a concert photographer. I had a lot of fun, but I don't leave my house after 8 p.m., so. Bold goal, not going to happen. But while I was at Ferris, I worked a lot in the remote production truck. Never took the class, but by doing that, I got community service, learned a lot, and it was reasonably low pressure while still being enjoyable. But what I have standing out to me now is that any time I worked in that truck, never once did I think, I want to work in sports. Not once. Um, how many people in this room are TDMP students? Oh, great, awesome, okay. So as some of you know, who are TDMP students, the program is pretty different to a traditional degree. We do the six month internship, 18 credits, after we've wrapped up all our classes. Um, senior sequence and that internship that follows sort of felt like this shiny trophy you're constantly working towards, but almost like terrified to win. No one speaks super highly of it, senior sequence, you know, it's this just 12 credits of really hard work and you better beware. Um, but it was also, you know, what you've been working towards your whole collegiate career and you're probably more ready for it than you think. But one thing I want to make sure that I get across is how important trusting yourself and trusting how you feel. Um, I don't think Nick and I had ever bumped heads more than during the process of searching for an internship. Um, I was really stubborn and I didn't want to stay in Michigan. I didn't want to go off of the list. I, I didn't want to follow any of the requests that they were making of me. Um, in my mind, internship was this perfect chance to have a six month trial of life as an adult outside of school, away from home. And I just, I wanted to try that. And so I made my reel to reflect what I wanted because I trusted that like this was my chance. There wasn't a single piece of school material in my reel because nothing I had done in school was what I wanted to be doing for work. Did I know what I wanted to do? No. But I knew what I didn't want to do. Motion to me is a way to tell a story. Uh, motion can be, you know, sliding or jumping, a wiggle or a shake. The word motion, I think, encompasses much more than being in motion. It's been absolutely incredible. Bang's Shoes has brought me people I would have never met. It has brought me to places I would have never dreamed of. It has brought me memories that I will never forget. Focus is 
a lens and a camera, is, is a shot, is a piece of art, is a conversation. that I was sending with my applications. Looking at it now, I can see a lot of things that I would want to change with it. But in 2018, this video was my pride and joy. I, I loved it, I loved what it represented of me, and I felt like I was a shoe in for any internship that I wanted. <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> I applied to easily 20 or 30 internships in a very small window of time. There was a constant search for new job postings, I was refreshing my cover letter, it felt like every day. My Google search history ranged from fun, paid video internships to cheapest US cities to live in. I wanted to leave Michigan, but like, I was still a college student. We had credits to pay for it, you know. I applied and I just wasn't super successful. My memory might be a little wrong, um, but I'm fairly certain that of those 20 or 30 applications, I only received two responses. Um, ego sufficiently checked, um, two out of three is, or two out of 30 is not great. It's 7% if you were wondering. Um, and I was holding out hope for one of these just like fun out of these world internships to reach out. But while I was waiting, I heard back from hy V. So what I knew about Hy-Vee was that one, they were a grocery store in Des Moines, and two, Des Moines was ranked the top 10 cheapest US cities to live in. <laughs> <laughs> My tip for everyone is to do your research before an interview because I should have gotten more information <laughs> before I went into the interview. But the interview itself actually went pretty well, at least as well as like a 25 minute interview can go. I made it clear to them I was willing to move to Iowa, and they made it clear that I would do video stuff. Um, they really couldn't tell me much else. <laughs> One of my other things is timing. Um, I said something about trust, and I'm going to say something about timing. Timing falls in line with trusting yourself, and timing is everything. Two days after my phone interview, I got an email offering me a 40-hour a week paid internship, which at the time felt like best case scenario. But I also was like, this is a grocery store in Iowa and I applied to this shoe company in Oregon. I would rather that. But at the end of the day, it was almost time to graduate. I needed an internship. And so I signed my acceptance letter for the job. And two hours later, I got the only rejection I received. So in a matter of hours, I managed to tie a bow on the only two responses I got and was officially planning a move to Iowa. Enter Iowa. On my first day of my internship, I found out that Hy-Vee was launching a digital network of shows that myself and another intern were going to be primarily responsible for. I also learned that Hy-Vee wasn't just a grocery store, and they were the largest Midwest grocery store chain with over 285 locations. So again, do your research, know more about what you're getting into. But this is what I was getting into. This is HSTV, Helpful Smiles Television. I started my internship in June, and by October their plans were to launch an 18-show network with four episodes per month of each show. Not only that, they wanted a backlog of the first three months before we launched. So immediately, life got crazy. I don't know why they put two interns in charge of <laughs> an 18 show network that they wanted to launch to a region of at least nine states. But we were doing it all from planning shoots, filming episodes, editing videos, and all of this while still trying to be 
general corporate video humans for a grocery store. I'm currently in the throes of potty training. Are you wondering what to do with all those leftovers from Thanksgiving? Hi, right, I'm the beer behind the bar with some drinks that you're going to be thankful for. <laughs> I just don't know that I can do it. Friendsgiving is probably the best holiday ever. So this is one of the first promotional videos ever made for HSTV. It's not the first first, but I don't work there anymore, so I only had access to so much. Um, but the idea of HSTV was that we were revolutionizing the grocery store industry and trying to kind of make a change in how people view their grocery stores and get information and content. Unfortunately, as cool as the launch videos were, they didn't do a whole lot for us. Uh, it would take quite a lot of time for anyone to have any sort of awareness of what we were doing. Um, that's one lesson that I had to learn very quickly is that there's a hard balance to find mentally when you're putting 50, 60, 70 hours a week of your life into something that even, you know, not even 1,000 of your 85,000 store employees have ever heard of, even though, you know, their stores are riddled with signage shouting about this thing. But we had three and a half months to launch this thing. And so, I'm just going to kind of run through a quick fire highlight of some of the things that we were doing between shoots every day or editing multiple videos in a day. Here's kind of a look. We transformed someone's living room into a stay at home workout set so that we could do a workout show. We filmed six episodes of a cooking show every day for three, four day shoot days. Um, they were easy peasy recipes, 30 minutes or less, you know, two cameras, fun. We tried to understand this guy. He's Italian. It was really hard. Um, he made great pasta, but couldn't understand a single thing he was saying. Um, we had grandparents doing really funny things with their grandchildren. Um, we transformed an entire kitchen in a, in a, oh man, in a very big labor of love. We took this store kitchen, vinyl countertop, stick on tiles, and 12 hours of work we made our dream clean, modern kitchen, very temporarily, um, and we finished at about 3.30 a.m., four hours before the shoot the next day. We went to Hobby Lobby and the craft store more times than I can count. Um, not a tip that I should give, but if you're ever doing some set design, Hobby Lobby takes a lot more in returns than you think. So <laughs> keep the tags on and you're golden. Um, we got very creative with set design and costumes, um, really just bringing everything together. And then we did it. We launched a network of content to the world. And while we were busy bringing this network of content into the world, I was busy signing an offer letter of full-time employment with hy -Vee. When I left for internship, didn't expect a full-time job, didn't expect to make Iowa a permanent home, um, but here was an opportunity to do what I love for a living while I was also nowhere near closer to figuring out what I wanted to do for the rest of my life anyway. Um, the role was very different than I expected. I signed on to become an assistant video producer for HSTV. And you can ask any TDMP professor who had me as a student and they would probably agree that producing was one of my worst skills. I avoided it like the plague, I did not like it, and I often lost points on it. So when someone was like, hey, we love what you're doing, we wanna hire you for this thing, crazy. But at the end of the day, I loved the work that I was doing and wanted to keep doing it. It's not really a spoiler alert, but I did eventually leave hy -Vee, and I will eventually be talking about sports. But when I left hy -Vee, this was the number of shows we had. So we started with 18, and by the time I left, there were 49 shows on the network. Um, COVID played a big role in that. Uh, we added a lot of content, but this isn't all of them, but this is a lot of them. And so this was kind of the most recent trailer when I left hy -Vee. Hi. Hey, y'all. Hi, I'm Yvette Rios. Hey, everyone. Hi. 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 Hey, guys. Hi. We're Helpful Smiles TV. 
We've got loads of content just waiting for you to explore. Over 49 original series streaming live just for you. From breakfast to brownies, it's the perfect time to take the time to try something new. So watch, laugh, and learn with HSTV.com. Don't miss what's next. Like and follow us at Helpful Smiles TV. Yes, my face was in there, and we're just going to kind of move past that. Um, but I, I, one of the shows was mine, and so that's just a different story. But as an assistant producer, I was both given my own shows to produce as well as tasks of shows to assist with because I was an assistant producer. I owned somewhere between five to ten of these shows and assisted with most of the others in some way. Um, like I said, the pandemic really caused a boost. Um, we added about five or six shows within the first month of COVID really happening to increase kind of content for parents to give to their kids to watch. Um, so there's a lot of shows that revolved around children and cooking and different things like that. Um, but some of my main tasks um, follow other duties as assigned. It's kind of always been my favorite term in the video industry. I feel like everyone holds really tightly to that and is kind of saying, other duties as assigned, you know? We don't want to be too specific. We want to make sure you can do everything. Um, but my main job's focused on coordination. I would work with our talent to set episodes, help with recipe concepting, set a shooting schedule that worked with them, but also worked with our editors, which was sometimes me, so that we could turn the content around in time to fit our posting schedule. I spent a lot of time in calendars, partnership spreadsheets, where I was looking for product placements to fit in our videos, because, you know, Hormel wanted to see Jenny O ground turkey in their video, and I had to force a chef to change their recipe to fit ground turkey. Um, some, oh gosh, what just happened? We'll get to that. Um, <laughs> Uh, some days I was like fully in the budget spreadsheet, you know, logging invoices, expenses, getting payments made. Um, and then other times I was just assisting on shows and I was going prop shopping and grocery shopping and grocery shopping and grocery shopping and always grocery shopping, um, set designing, all of that stuff. Um, and it was, it was great. I mean, I, I loved it. But if you're unhappy, Ask for what you need. Producing is not for everyone. It's really, really hard, plain and simple. It's hard work. And throughout my two years as an assistant producer, I had grown so much in my role, but I felt like my skills as a videographer, as an editor, as a photographer were taking a back seat and I had become a lot less competent with them. And what had made this realization extra difficult was that I was finally kind of starting to figure out what I was passionate about and it was not the price of grapes. Yeah, it's a lot bigger on that screen, okay. Um, so anyway, throughout 2019, and while watching the 2019 Women's World Cup, I had started to connect some dots. I realized that I could use my love of soccer and my love of video and photo to tell the stories of teams. I hadn't really ever made that connection, you know? I spent years in the remote production truck with football and hockey and never once was like, wow, video and sports, it's a thing. Um, but watching the World Cup, watching the content that came out of it really made me realize how much of a market there was and I just needed to figure out how I could combine them for myself. Um, so on October 5th, 2019, I sat in the stands in Chicago and said, by the time I was 25, I would be on the field working with the team. And we'll get to that. So back to this. Because I had finally figured out what I was passionate about, couldn't necessarily go for it with the skills sitting on the back burner like I felt like they were as an assistant producer. And I requested a change. With my bosses at Hy-Vee, I asked if I could transition into an assistant editor. I wanted to be more involved in the production. I wanted to get back. I wanted to work those muscles. And they let me. And I will always be grateful for that because it helped me grow and utilize opportunities. But it wasn't the change that I needed. I thought that that would be a magic solve, but as I was constantly getting rejections from sports teams that I was applying to, um, I just realized that like I couldn't do both. 
So on May 19th, I got rejected from another job. This was probably the 10th sports rejection that I had gotten in the span of six, eight months. Um, and honestly, I didn't have the experience. It's fair, they could, they could reject me. Um, but I had been photographing professional games in Kansas City. I was driving back and forth from Iowa to Kansas City. And I had spent two months working for free with Drake women's soccer team, trying to get as much experience, build as much of a portfolio as I could while still working a full-time job. And it wasn't easy. So this is a little video. not the best, but you all start somewhere. Um, so I was steadily building this portfolio with the options and resources I had available, but I just, I kept getting more exhausted, I kept getting more rejections, and it wasn't getting me to where I needed to be. So I left. Um, on my, May 19th, when I got that final rejection, I kind of realized that I could leave hy V without something in place. Um, it was a terrifying decision to make, but I connected with family in Kansas City, set up a free place to live, and um, hopefully was just going to spend a few months continuing to photograph, continuing to build a portfolio, and hopefully get a job somewhere. So I put my two weeks into hy V and had my last day exactly three years from the day that I started. I moved to Kansas City two weeks later, and most of my life went into storage, and I moved into a little room in my grandparents' house with, you know, no job in sight, but a goal. So, remember when I said that? The day I moved to Kansas City, a job that I had completely forgotten about reached out to me and asked if I wanted to schedule a phone interview. I have no idea when I applied to this job, but it was from US Soccer, it was for an internship, and I was just applying to internships because I was like, well, if you don't have experience, start at the ground level. Start where they might actually bring you in. And a week later, I was sitting down on the phone with a national team producer for an interview. And it was this totally surreal experience because I never thought that I'd even be making a call with US Soccer. It seemed like a very pipeline dream. But then timing continued to be everything. And later that day, I saw that the women's professional team in Kansas City was also posting for an internship. I applied because why not have options? Um, and things stayed really silent for a couple weeks. And then of course, because they're annoying, they both responded to me at two weeks later asking for more interviews. So I kind of let that be, had the more interviews, went through a very long process for an internship. Um, you know, my one experience was a 25 minute phone call got me a job and I was now in the third round of interviews. Um, and then within days of each other, they both offered me a role. So I had a decision to make. And I continued to go with trust and continue to go with timing. US soccer was everything I wanted. And it's everything that I thought I wanted when I made my goal. But they were offering me an internship that required me to move to Chicago for a lowly paid internship. And I was gonna log footage every day for 40 hours a week. Whereas Kansas City was offering me also a very low paid internship and less hours, but they were gonna have me shoot edit and photograph things for the team. And I could still live in Kansas City for free. I don't know if you've been to Chicago, it's really expensive just to exist for a day, let alone your life. Um, but Kansas City made the most sense and I was trying to trust my gut, but I was really nervous that I'd never get to work for US soccer again. I was like, what if I turned them down and that was my one chance? And my mom actually said, what if you can't afford to eat? And I was like, well, that seems like a problem for another day. <laughs> but I was like, okay, 
Kansas City, I'll go. I'll choose Kansas City. I'll do this. But I'll leave U.S. soccer as open as I can. You know, right job, wrong time. I don't want to close this window. I don't want to close this opportunity. I want to keep the avenues open. I hope our paths cross in the future. So day one in KC, I was already photographing stuff. I showed up to a meeting off-site. They had me photograph a shirt. I didn't even have my laptop yet, my work laptop. And they're like, when are the pictures going to be here? I was like, not yet. But I was able to kind of have this really chaotic day, but it felt like a really exciting start to a new journey. You know, I was getting paid to work in soccer. It was everything I had wanted two years prior. And so just like at Javi, I stepped into a role that had an impending launch. KC was a new team in the league, and they were operating off of a very um, temporary name, and it was all building to the launch of their new brand at the end of the 2021 season. So leading up to that, I got to be fully immersed in this world. You know, I was filming trainings while also photographing trainings, filming interviews, community events, merch launches, new beers, um, everything. We were doing it all. And quickly my internship was moved to 40 hours, and not too long after that, I was offered a full-time job, and I was officially a full-time employee in the National Women's Soccer League, which was top-tier goal for me. Um, it was not a job that I expected. It was much lower pay than I expected, but it was a job that was going to make me happy. And so to me, a corporate America job that paid really well did not compare to a job that was going to make me inspired in my creative roles. October 2021, uh, I got to work my first ever game with U.S. Soccer. They stayed true to their word. They kept in touch. They reached out to me when they were coming to Kansas City, and they asked me to work the game with them. And I did really badly. Um, I, I, it's some of the worst footage I think I've ever gotten in soccer, even compared to that other video. I, it was really bad. I was so nervous. I was so uncomfortable. I just, I didn't, it was everything. It was a dream. And I just was like, wow, this went really poorly for me. Um, but to me, that was it. I accomplished the goal. I worked in soccer. I worked for the national team. And, you know, I, I checked that list. I checked that box. Um, and so less than a week after checking that box, the Kansas City Current was born. Just three short months after starting in KC, I helped launch the new brand. There was a, a light show on the field during the game. We immediately turned around and had a merch shoot the day after the game um, to get all the players in the merch. You know, we, we filmed this exciting launch video. And it was so cool to be a part of something that an entire city was behind. And I was finally feeling like I was in a position where I was proud of my work and I could see myself growing in what I was creating and could also see return on that work. Was I generally like overworked and completely not used to sports? Yes. But even then, I loved it. So, the off season. It doesn't exist. Um, the, it does for the players. You know, they get to go home, they get to take a rest, maybe a vacation. Off season for the content team is never off. And it's definitely not off for the content team of a franchise with a new brand. We were constantly making videos, we were pushing out the brand to the city, you know, to the league. We were trying to get people involved. And I was getting this glimpse into what it truly meant to work in sports and it felt almost more like a full-time position than I ever had at hy -Vee. So during the off-season, we still had merch going live. We had community events. We had a streetcar that got unveiled. We had a whole draft, and we even signed new players. And it was all jam-packed into this very short amount of time. And to add to the craziness of it all, U.S. Soccer could call you out of the blue and ask you what your schedule is for the next four months. And then you begin to question everything. Um, so while I was in the middle of feeling pretty content in my role and moving on from U.S. Soccer and that job, they were deciding that I might be able to be of assistance to them. So I got an offer from U.S. Soccer in late November. They asked me if I would be available to travel with their U-20 women's youth national team while they participated in World Cup qualifiers in 2022. I was shocked. 
I was like, you took what I did in October and said she might be good for this. <laughs> and I was like, that's your choice to make. But I didn't really know what that meant for my job at Kansas City. So I went to my bosses and presented the proposal to them. And my immediate boss very quickly was like, this is something you need to do. He had no pull to be able to say that. So then there were a lot of conversations that I wasn't a part of. Um, and it took about a month and a half for those conversations to finally get to the point where I was able to go. Um, and so early in January, I got the official OK to take a sabbatical from Kansas City to go with the U-20s and document their World Cup qualifying. Because of that, I went to a camp in January and got to test the processes of what camp means for the national teams and how that works content-wise. And so this is the first ever video I made for US Soccer in January of 2022. I took a day of training and photos and created some sort of hype video for social. And so I, I made a couple other videos during this camp and was able to learn the processes of the pace that US Soccer requires. All right. Yeah. Still some room for improvement, but also just working with my own equipment, figuring out how to do it. Um, and I left that camp and immediately went into preseason with Kansas City, not really knowing at the time that that would kind of be the end of my time with Kansas City. So preseason was long and short all at the same time. You know, we had a jersey shoot, we had more merch. And we went to Florida. They went to Florida for six weeks. I went to Florida for 12 days and documented them doing two-a-days, doing trainings. We did mic'd ups. We did all sorts of content to try and you know show this team, show them working hard. And on February 15th, I drove from preseason in Tampa to pre-camp in Fort Lauderdale and officially went on a sabbatical, which also at 24. Sabbatical feels like such an old term, but um, I went to the U-20 World Cup qualifying camp, and it was exhausting. Um, even though I had gotten an idea of the processes, I don't think anything can fully prepare you for what a youth tournament is like. Um, going into a youth camp, you are the sole content person. So you work with a press officer, and you create every single video, you create all the photos, you create the content plan, you do the interviews, you edit them, you film trainings, you photograph games. And there were seven games in this tournament in the span of about two weeks. So one, these children are having to turn around and work very hard very often. Um, but you're creating everything um, whenever you have the time. So this is kind of a look at some of the photos that I could find on my computer, um, you know, trainings, games, everything. Um, this is just a sample. So like I said, there's seven games. You know, you're taking 1,600, 2,000, however many photos a game. And the youth team ended up qualifying for the World Cup. And the night of that game, I was offered to travel with the U-20s for their entire cycle, which meant three camps throughout 2022, as well as a Youth World Cup. And I was like, I have a job. Um, and I, I didn't feel worthy for this. I felt like that was a really bold offer. And I didn't know what it meant for my job back in Kansas City. But I also knew we had a championship match to play for, and that needed to be my focus. So this is an arrival video. It's very, very much embedded in the social plan for US soccer. Um, but it was you know, their first championship game, it was their arrival video, and I was making this, hoping they won, and also being like, what do I do with my life? Um, so this is that one. There might be a distance, but we will go the way. This is our time. This is our destiny. This is when all the stars align, and we make this story.
really hit the money on the nose with that song there. Um, they won. It was incredible. It was super awesome. I honestly wanted to cry. It was such a beautiful thing to experiment, experience and document this journey of these young girls kind of doing what they've grown up to do. Um, and it was this long, long, month-long journey coming to a close in such a big way. And I still haven't really been able to accurately describe what it means to kind of follow a team through a championship and win and kind of document their unbridled joy, like throwing confetti in the air. Um, but I also knew that I had a decision to make. And so I decided that I would return to KC and kind of feel things out. Some things had been harder than others when I had left, and I just wanted to see how things were going before I gave U.S. Soccer an answer. Um, and this is where trusting myself came in again, because six months prior, when I was looking at Kansas City for a job, I wasn't ready to lose the security of a full-time job. It's kind of ingrained in you growing up that full-time is safe, and that you, you need to do that if you want to live and be happy, and you need to work, you need to grind, you need to do whatever. Um, and so it was all I knew. But now I was being offered general security and the opportunity of a lifetime to kind of go and document a World Cup. So when I got to KC, things were a mess. Um, within two days, I was like, I need, to, I need to take this chance because nothing's going to change here. And when else am I going to get to document a World Cup? So within a week of being back, I put in my two weeks at Kansas City. And uh, as of April 1st, I became an official freelancer. But this was kind of my last two weeks at Kansas City. We, I traveled twice with the team. We went to two different away games. I over-documented everything to try and give them back stock for when I left. And it was one of the hardest decisions I made because I loved this team. I spent months capturing them, documenting their journey, getting to know them, making them comfortable with me. Um, but, you know, I just, I had to do it. I cried so hard on my last day. Did not expect that. Um, my photos were printed all over the training facility. It was something that, you know, we had built together and I was leaving it. But I was also making the right choice. So I showed you the first video I made. This one, I'm not going to play it because we already watched it. So this is the most recent video I created for U.S. Soccer. It launched three days ago. Um, at our game in St. Louis. It's, again, a pretty routine arrival video. We do it every camp, camp pre-game. So... These are some of my favorite videos. Um, we kind of put them together the day before. We get footage around the stadium at match day minus one, and then there's usually three of us that are filming arrivals so that we can get every angle, someone off the bus, someone on the field, and then you know, you're know you rushing into the photo work room to kind of dump cards at the editor and be like, here, add it, do it, finish it, and then it goes up on social. Um, and so it's been a year of videos like this, photos, flights, so we're going to go through some quick stats. Um, so 47 flights in a year. Um, that's, you know, flights to camp, flights in camp, a lot of flights. Some of these are commercial flights, and sometimes with the national team, these are private charters. Um, and you have to fly to all these different cities, but it adds up. Um, uh, this math is wrong. I fixed it in the car, but it's. Eight states, six countries, and even more cities, um, because we've been to Florida like seven times. Um, but in the last year, I've gotten to travel to the Dominican Republic twice, France, Costa Rica, England, Spain, and New Zealand, which is pictured there. That's not, I didn't see that during camp. I stayed. You don't see anything during camp. That's something I want to, that's something I want to mention. Um, you don't see where you go. You see a hotel and you see a stadium. So it is very cool, but... I've been to 16 different stadiums. Um, one of the most notable ones was Wembley. It was a bucket list stadium to see. Um, and then I just, just like a moment for all the cool stadiums that we've been to. Um, this is not all of them, but we've done three jersey shoots. 
Two of them were with the youth teams, getting all their headshots in their new jerseys, and most recently we did one with the national team. Um, and so these are some behind the scenes film photos. And 34 games in the last year. So 23 youth games, 14 of which came in the span of like a month and a half. And then uh, 11 games with the senior national team, but 34 games of getting to do what I love for a team I grew up watching. So, some things I've learned. Time management. It's really small, but that's what our schedule looks like in camp. Um, pretty much everything is scheduled for you from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Breakfast is on the schedule. Training is on the schedule. The little red is like, oh, communications is going to depart 15 minutes before the team or whatever. Your entire life is scheduled. Um, and then when it's not scheduled, you're editing videos, you're logging footage, you're doing media role. And so how do I do the work that I do? Time management. And also hotel provided food and laundry. Um, that's one of the biggest things is that they do your laundry. So you just, you don't think about anything. You just do your work, you show up. And then for the gear nerds in here, um, this is our game day lineup, or at least it was on Tuesday. Um, I should have made a stat on how many cameras I've worked with, but this is what we've been rolling with lately. So consistently at least three people shoot a game for the national team. Oftentimes they bring in freelancers as well that are not in camp, and you kind of rack up to five to seven different people shooting the game. It's really excessive, I agree. Um, but our lead videographer this camp shot with an A7S III 16 to 35 millimeter lens on a Ronin, and then she shot the game with an Amira camera and a Canon 25 to 250 lens on it. I get to shoot on an A7 as well, and I do a 24 to 70 lens, and then I shoot on an FX9 with the Fujinon 22 by lens. Not my favorite lens in the world. Don't think it has the highest quality, but has a lot of range. It's insane. And then we had our other shooter on an FX9 with a 400 millimeter prime. And if you want to talk highest quality, that thing is beautiful. Um, there was an FS7 on the top 50 and an FX6 roaming with a 70 to 200. And pretty much you have any angle that you could wish for when you add in the like nine cameras that broadcast has. Uh, so it makes for really well-rounded footage and it allows us to get as many moments as we possibly can. So this is the staff for the national team and I think it's just very representative of everything it takes to do what you do. You know, not every one of these people is part of the communication team, but every one of these people works to help you do your job. And the past year of becoming a freelancer has kind of been a big blur. It was everything I worked towards and then immediately it was all at once. So it's pretty stressful to be so fully aware of kind of everything you're doing, money, paychecks, you know, expenses, getting called into camps and time management. But it showed me that I can handle more than I thought I could. And all in all, it's shown me that I can fully trust in the process and trust myself. But a lot can change over the years, but my love for the game really hasn't. And now I've made a career out of it, which has been pretty dang cool. So that's, that's it, that's all I've got. Um, but yeah, mostly just trust yourself. And then enjoy these throwback photos of Nick and Josh, please. <laughs> this is the uh, Q and A mic. All right. So if anyone's got Q and A because this is being done for video, we want you to be on the mic before you ask your question, so that the video can pick up the mic. How you doing? My name is D Jones. I just want to know what are uh, what was the challenging part about transitioning. Uh, and giving up the opportunity for you um, transitioning from Kansas to USA soccer. And how has that helped you build character now that you're a part of the highest tier of uh, sports for women? I think one of the hardest parts is probably um, knowing, it's probably the security of it. To go from a full-time job to freelance and knowing that you have to speak up for yourself and find your work um, and never knowing what camp I'll be called into. It's very similar to the players. I'm like, am I going to the next camp? 
Um, and so that's probably one of the hardest parts is just kind of making that transition. But I would say that it's impacted my work in the sense of being at the highest level because of the respect. Like I have so much respect for these athletes and I have so much respect for all the work that goes into it. I mean, in 2019, I was like, wow, this is cool content. And now I'm in a camp watching everything that goes into it, watching the people who book the hotels, book the training facilities, schedule the meals, do everything about that. And I realized that I'm a small part of that. And then I can just do my job as best as I can to help those other people. Uh, hi. So my question is kind of around how much creative freedom do you actually have when you are working on like those arrivals and that kind of thing? Uh, do they tell you what music to do? Do they tell you like what shots you have to get or, or do you kind of have a liberty to shoot how you like and edit how you like? It kind of depends. So with the youth teams being the only content person, you have pretty much all the freedom. Um, with the senior team, you still have a lot of freedom. I was just talking about this today. Um, we have a producer, and if you're assigned a video, you kind of get to produce that video. So they have a few different music libraries that you can choose from, and generally speaking, there's a, a tone. Obviously, they're a little bit more pump up, they're a little bit more anticipatory, but Outside of that, you get to produce the video. So you get to tell the other people who are shooting arrivals, I want this type of shot, I want this type of movement. Um, and it's really kind of up to you uh, how you do it. And then obviously you send it for a review and they can strike some things. But generally speaking, with those one-off videos, they trust us as creatives to get what they need done. So saying your job is stressful might be an understatement. <laughs> How do you manage stress and what tools can we as students and um, future professionals, you know, do? Um, well, uh, so the peanut gallery up here, this is my, my family and friends knows that sometimes I don't manage the stress very well. Um, but I will say last year I picked up reading when we were in the Dominican Republic, it took an hour to travel to training. And so I just started reading on the bus. Um, and one of the massage therapists in camp told me that I was a mess. And so I got a massage gun and a lacrosse ball to help the tightness in my body. Um, but I would say find something that shuts your brain off. So for me, I read cheesy fiction books because it doesn't require me to think. I just, I read them. It's a brain break from the screen. And that's mostly what I do. But I would say find something that helps you shut your brain off and steps away from a screen. I think all of us know that we spend a bajillion hours in front of a screen. And so taking a step away from that is very helpful. And so find something that helps you step away from a screen, whether it's, you know, stretching, reading, working out, something like that. But just give yourself a break um, and kind of remove yourself from the situation, even if it's for five minutes. Yesterday, when I was stressing to finish this presentation, I walked around the block. It was great. It was beautiful. Um, and that was enough. Five minutes. Just give me a break, refresh, and get back to it. So uh, what are the, really the biggest differences between freelancing directly with a team versus being hired by them? Because I notice a lot of uh, professional freelancers, they work with the same types of teams, and it seems like a pretty consistent kind of job. So what are the, kind of the differences between the two? Um, I would say it's slightly hard for me to fully answer that. Um, like the team photographer with the U.S. team, he works for ISI, which is similar to Getty and the team hires ISI, and he has just become kind of the main guy that photographs the team. Um, but I would say there's probably a difference in how much you have to sell yourself. So I have managed to establish myself with US Soccer to the point where they will call me into camps if they need me, and I am available for the youth camps. And that alone can kind of get me enough work. Um, so I'm not 
pushing myself out in the like Kansas City market as much as I could be to be like, hey, I'm available for work. And I also have the connection with the Kansas City women's team as well, having worked there. So I would say, as opposed to people who aren't with a team, there's just a different element of how much you're selling yourself, how much networking you're having to do, how many connections you're having to make, because it's not as established. Uh, before I hand this to the next student, just to follow up, would, have you ever heard of the phrase permalance? No. Would you describe yourself as effectively permalance for the women's national team because you're a permanent freelance? They're your first call, or you're their first call, I guess. Yeah, I guess I haven't heard that term before, but that's probably yes. I am a... I'm in their network of contractors, basically. So they have a network of people. They have a lot of people in other areas. Um, but I am kind of outside of their full-time people, the first call for youth teams if there's not something happening with the senior teams. And I'm in the list of two or three people that they call immediately for senior teams. So my question kind of follows up to some of theirs. I'm wondering if, like, so when you're working for the national team, are you a gig worker or are you like on their payroll or how does that work on the business side of things? Do you have your own business? Like, I have something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my dad would prefer that I have a more established something. Um, but yes, I established a day rate with them for when I'm in camp and an hourly rate for them when I'm outside of camp. But basically, U.S. Soccer has a difference between whether or not you're embedded in the camp or not. And I am typically embedded in the camp, which means I use my day rate. They provide my hotel. They provide my flight. They provide all the food. I eat in the meal room with the teams. I get provided casual clothing to wear. They provide the training gear. Um, with the youth teams, I use my gear and charge an equipment rental. And with the senior teams, I use their gear and don't charge anything. But essentially everything that I do is covered and I charge them a day rate. And then when camp has wrapped up, I just invoice them everything and they send me that check. Um, so I am not technically on their payroll. Um, I am a contractor, I invoice them and then they give me money. So, hello. Um, Hi. So earlier in your presentation, when you're talking about uh, Kansas City and um, U.S. Nationals, or whatever it's called, sorry. Um, you just talked about leaving the door open, and you're able to negotiate a sabbatical. So mm -hmm. what are some of these like interpersonal interview skills that you developed to like make these opportunities for yourself? Um, I would say as far as leaving the door open, I was just very clear in my email that... At that time, moving Chicago wasn't moving to Chicago wasn't feasible for me, and I left it. I was like, this job would be an honor. It is what I would like to be doing, and I would love to work with you in the future. I made it clear that I wasn't turning them down. I was turning the opportunity itself down, um, and they were very kind and very understanding and responded with, you know, if we're ever in town, we'll reach out. I thought they were lying because they announced the Kansas City game and didn't reach out. Um, eventually they did, but that was kind of the big thing is I, I just didn't want to burn that bridge. Um, as far as, what was the other part? Um, like, you negotiated yes. Yes. So the interviews, I still, I still don't understand that. Um, three, three interviews for an internship just seems like a lot. Um, for U.S. Soccer, I interviewed with a producer, I interviewed with a guy above him, and then I interviewed with like the head of marketing or something, which, wild to me. Um, and for Kansas City, I interviewed with the other videographer. I did a practical interview where I edited a video for them, and then I had another one. Um, and that one itself was just kind of, um, my main thing was showing the passion I had for the work I was interviewing for. So it was very easy for me to be passionate about the league, about the teams. It was something I spent a lot of time interacting with. And so it was very easy for me to show that I had the passion, passion the knowledge for the sport, and that I could be beneficial to them. Um, as opposed to the sabbatical, I have no idea. Um, I told my boss, and he was immediately like, oh my gosh, you have to go. And then he goes, ah, I can't make that decision. And I was like, OK, cool, so who can? 
And then um, a lot of the owners of the team had the conversations themselves and I was not privy to them. Um, all I know is that I had people in my corner through work that were willing to vouch for me and at the end of the day they felt like it would be a great opportunity and could also open a door of connection for Kansas City with US soccer as well as give me skills to grow. Um, I think they always knew it was a possibility that I would leave and no one really faulted me for that. Uh, it was kind of a no-brainer to take the chance to go to a World Cup. Um, but yeah, they just, I think it was able to leave that door open because they understood in the sports world it, it makes sense to want to go for that next opportunity. Okay, this is going to be our last question. So obviously I think you'd say that um, the relationships in your job have meant a whole lot. I was just wondering how important you think these relationships are to your career and have these relationships ever made a decision hard to make? Ooh. Um, yes, I think the relationships are, are my career. I think that they are partly why I am where I am. Um, I think making those relationships was very important. I didn't find out about the Kansas City internship um, until you know I had followed the videographer on Instagram and he posted it on his story. So I had connected with him when I shot games as a photographer with media and ended up being able to find out about that because of that relationship, because I instigated communication with him. Um, and so I don't think that I would have the role that I have without those relationships. Um, what was the other part? Just. Oh, yes. Um, I think especially in the role of creatives and working with video and photo, um, the people that you're documenting need to be comfortable with you. You know, you're not going to get the media that you want if people aren't comfortable with you sticking a camera in their face. And so I think one of the hardest things for me was to leave the players at Kansas City. Um, they had a horrible first season. They won three games in the entire season and they were all at the end of the season. So being there and documenting like all their triumphs with all of their disappointments um, bye, um, were just, it was, it was very difficult to leave because I was like, I love these players. They are comfortable with me. I am comfortable with them. Like I know what to do to get them to make great content. They, they loved working with me, I loved working with them, and it was so hard to leave. Because I was like, I, I don't want to leave even just if you lose this content. Like, I'm not the best, but I, I know how to get great things from them. And I was worried that, you know, they wouldn't have the opportunity to shine if they didn't have someone that they were comfortable with. And so I think it makes decisions really hard, but I also think they were also willing to support me because they knew what an opportunity it was. And I still work with them as a freelancer and I get hugs from every one of them when I come back. And it's just, you know, cultivating those relationships and trying to keep them. All right, everyone show your appreciation for Lauren. Yeah.